Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Elifetrios Milonikas, who is a professor of infectious diseases at Brown University and the chief of infectious diseases at Rhode Island and Miriam Hospitals. He is also the director of the Cobra Center for Antimicrobial Resistance and Therapeutic Discovery. He is assistant dean for outpatient investigations and director of the Center for Outpatient and Longitudinal Medical Research at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University and Professor of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology. He has eight patents and almost 400 articles in peer-reviewed literature. Welcome, Lefteris. Hi, Gil. Nice to be with you. Uh, I want to start with, you know, some of the very interesting research that's going on in your lab, um, lab at Brown, um, especially in the area of surrogate invertebrate hosts for antimicrobial research. And um, you you say that compartmentalization of pathogenesis related research into an analysis of the pathogen, the host, or the antimicrobial compound has largely been dictated by the lack of model systems in which all of these approaches can be used simultaneously and by the traditional view that microbiology, immunology, and clinical biology, as well as pharmacology, are separate disciplines. Uh, you say that we have you know, gene-based tools now to sort of integrate all of this and, and accelerate, um, accelerate discovery and development. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, well, I think that this is uh, part uh, part of uh, of uh, a challenge, and is also recognizing how my brain works better. <laughs> yes. So, so it's a, it's an excuse probably for me to just uh, be allow my my brain to work on different uh, parts, so I don't get uh, bored. Right. So, <laughs> so. Uh, I sometimes am amazed by people who can spend uh, decades or their whole careers uh, studying one protein or one part of uh, one particular uh, host pathogen interaction. Yeah, and uh, and my brain works a little different. Uh, I I try to uh, stay stimulated. So so it, it sounds it sounds good, but uh, this is uh, this is a vote against the Aristotelian uh, approach of making boxes and trying to uh, uh, differentiate disciplines. Yeah. And tr- and uh, my approach is more towards uh, trying to uh, put a, a problem and try to find the best way to get an answer yeah. about this problem. So instead of, of using, uh, trying to, to find the best use for my hammer, I just uh, pose a question and then I, I see what uh, scientific approach I can use 
in order to to get closer to an answer to to this question so so this is the general frame of mind and and, and then I'll I'll talk to you about the invertebrate model hosts so yeah. so I cannot really take a lot of credit about that uh, I, this was developed in the in the lab of my uh, mentor, uh, former mentor and current uh, colleague and good friend, uh, Fred Azubel, mm-hmm. uh, up at uh, Harvard, uh, uh, who allowed me to join his lab uh, as a postdoctoral fellow. And uh, he developed the approach of studying a small host. Uh, he started with C. elegans. Yeah. C. elegans is a small nematode, one millimeter in size. These are, uh, these are round, round ones? This is right, yes, yeah. correct. Around worms, uh, the first uh, animal that had its genome sequence, the model host, but it's a very small host. They live in the environment. Uh, they, we believe that they survive by eating microbes. Yeah, and they have a very rudimentary, uh, relative to the human, uh, probably rudimentary uh, host response system. Hmm. But uh, the important thing is that if you have a, a small micro infection in this uh, model host, then you don't have to do an in vitro assay. Yeah. This is a host that is big enough to allow you to study host pathogen interaction without having to uh, use mice or uh, do expensive. You still can do high throughput screening of thousands and thousands of compounds. Yeah. So you can have in a small well in a 384 well plate, you can have a, a pathogen, mm-hmm. you can have a host, and you can have, you can have a compound, yeah. which breaks through uh, the host pathogen interaction, or for me as a physician also adds the practical aspect of how can I treat this infection. Right, right. So this is uh, this is high throughput screening. So just very simplistically, you have thousands of uh, small wells where you have these worms, uh, you have the pathogen in there, and then you're attempting uh, many different compounds to see where the activity might be? Yes, that is a very very simple way. That's how I explain it to my daughters. (laughs) And that doesn't sound very uh, very novel, but uh, it is uh, uh, quite interesting, actually, because the way that we do it is screening by imaging. So you, we can screen thousands of compounds every week. And also uh, what uh, it, it's interesting is that uh, we we use also a robot to dispense the, the worms. Right. And, and that allows a very, very high, you know, uh, enables us to, again, to be high throughput, have a standard number of worms of exactly the same size in each well. So we start with the same number and then we can uh, use a fluorescent dye to to stain the dead worms. And then we do screening by imaging uh, in order to identify the wells where there was a lot of survival. And then we can go and identify the compound that was there. And what is fascinating with that is that you identify compounds that you wouldn't have been able to find with an in vitro screen. Right. And uh, also you can find compounds that they work on the immunity of the worm. So they augment the immunity and allow the worm to, to fight the infection. Hmm. Or they, you have uh, the compounds that decrease the virulence of the pathogen. Those uh, groups of compounds you cannot really find with a straightforward in vitro screen. Right. Of right. And, and so... You know, in terms of the the, the different uh, preclinical testing that uh, that we typically go through in pharmaceuticals, this has a potential of really really going to the clinic a lot faster. I would imagine, right? Well, uh, the again, I have to take you uh, two steps back in yeah. order to to answer this question. So, if you allow me, sure. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is not. Uh, this is not done by choice. The, for the longest time, the drug discovery was mostly left in pharmaceutical companies yeah. where they had their own libraries, they had their own screening equipment, they had their own medicinal chemists, and they were able to, to go through and discover a new antimicrobials. Uh, 
reasonably with some reasonable uh, time frame and uh, and uh, dependable uh, approach mm. and dependent approach so the the problem is that the pharmaceutical companies abandon this field <laughs> for many reasons i don't know if you want to discuss them but, uh, sure, but sure. Yeah. it's not part of the of the particular question mm. but in any case they abandon it so it is uh, now left to academia to yeah. try and fill that gap and right. academia can do some of the aspects of pharmaceutical drug discovery, but uh, but not uh, as effectively. And we have to find shortcuts. Right. So there are a couple of uh, areas where academia has great difficulty. Hmm. The first one is the identifying a hit. Yeah. So for academia, we need to be able to identify usable hits more effectively than pharma. Because right. uh, because for us, following up on a hit means a big commitment of time. We have a small research lab. We don't have uh, uh, the big number of, of people that can follow on hi hits and we don't have the capabilities on uh, and the technology that is needed. So we need yeah. to, to, to rationalize our hits and have a reasonable low uh, hit number. Right. The second part is we need to screen for toxicity really quickly. Toxicity is the bottleneck of antimicrobial drug discovery. Yeah. As you have seen with, uh, with the discussion about COVID-19, finding compounds that in vitro have some efficacy is not very difficult. Right. Uh, the problem yeah. is that uh, some of them are not good uh, drugs. They are more like <clears throat> things that we can use for cleaning or things that are very toxic. Yeah. So, so that is another bottleneck that we need to address very quickly. So, we, again, we don't waste our time with toxic compounds that uh, takes uh, take us nowhere. So, if you have a if you have a host in there, a eukaryotic cell, if if you have something that is very toxic, then it will kill the host. It won't come as a hit. You don't waste your time trying to discover it. Yeah. Finally, one uh, one other area where uh, academia has great difficulty is developing analogs of compounds. Mm -hmm. So when you go from a hit in a hit compound in order to get to a lead compound, which is a starting point from going to mouse studies, etc., uh, you need to take your chemical and optimize it. Optimize usually means improve efficacy, decrease toxicity. That is the easy thing. Yeah. Uh, pharmaceutical companies used to be able to make hundreds of those analogs. As soon as they had a hit, they hundreds of analogs and then work from there, find the, the part of the molecule that is the most active and, and improve on that. Right. right. Now, now I, even if I have uh, two or three collaborators, uh, medicinal chemists that collaborate with me, it's impossible to get hundreds. At the most, <laughs> yeah. we can convince them to get a, a, a handful of analogs. Right. So in order for us to get those uh, targeted analogs, we need to have some in vivo results. That yeah. also is an added value on doing the uh, screening, the high throughput screening using a, a, a host like C. Arigans. So right. hopefully I answered, I went a very circular way to answer your answer, but uh, but uh, I think that, uh, I hope that I gave you enough context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, so, to, so two things. One is, so uh, this type of an approach uh, is more in discovery uh, where you're doing the screening. And uh, since you say it's in vivo testing, you have less chance of a toxic compound entering the preclinical development phase. Um, do you see um, opportunities there to compress the timeline too in preclinical? Uh, so you, you, you know, both finding the compound as well as when you, when you find it, uh, because it's an in vivo experiment, you are, uh, you are likely finding things that are not toxic, right? So you don't necessarily have to go through, you know, the elaborate process uh, pharma companies go through in preclinical. Well, we, we do screen for toxicity. Uh, that yeah. is, uh, of course, you have to screen for toxicity against mammalian uh, cells, lines, uh, but uh, you just increase the likelihood that your heat will make it through those toxicity screens. Yeah. So, so that is, uh, uh, there is uh, more than 50% of our heats 
have no toxicity in mammalian cell lines. Uh, I would say that is is higher, significantly higher than fifty percent, which is which is extraordinary. Yeah. Then, then I have to say that our main goal is not only to find the compound. Our main goal is to find the target. Right. Uh, the mode of action is what is academically more stimulating. Mm. Uh, and also, it gives us the flexibility. If this compound turns out to have a very poor uh, pharmacokinetics or this compound has some unexpected toxicity or some other difficulty, if we find the target, then we can allow uh, our lab or other labs to screen against the target. So if we identify a novel target for 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 a druggable compound, mm-hmm. then even if that uh, particular hit doesn't develop and go to preclinical steps, through the preclinical steps, still that is a target where others can screen their compounds right. and they can identify a new compounds that are less toxic and they can move those forward. Right, right. Yeah, so when you say, uh, Lefteris, when you say pharma has abandoned uh, this, do you mean uh, pharma has, is that specific to antimicrobial research or you're saying in general, high throughput screening type approaches and discovery, uh, pharma's not doing too much of that anymore? I I, I don't know about, uh, in general, the the number of uh, uh, High throughput screens that they do for other fields. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I am working on antimicrobial drug discovery, yeah. and that is a particular problem. Uh, I'm sure that they have had uh, great progress on on discovering new uh, uh, medications, for example, for cancer. Uh, I was I was just uh, getting uh, I was renewing my boards for uh, medicine la- last year. Yeah, and uh, I, there were. Since the previous time, 10 years ago, that I had to go through the same process, there were more than 200 new uh, antineoplastic agents that I had to to learn. Mm-hmm. And from from medica- from antibiotics, it was uh, you know less than 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was I was so jealous of, <laughs> of you know of, uh, of people who work on oncology, all those big discoveries that have happened there. So so. Uh, uh, there, there are many reasons. I, I, this doesn't is not meant to be uh, necessarily putting the blame on pharmaceutical companies. This is a very distorted market yeah. that needs to change. But uh, I'm stating as a matter of fact that uh, uh, antimicrobial drug discovery uh, has uh, has to evolve. And the market has to evolve in order to find new treatments. Otherwise, we're going to be at, uh, seeing more and more resistant infections that we cannot treat. Yeah. Uh, so I think, um, I mean, I haven't followed the field that closely, but, um, you know, economics to some extent drove uh, big farm out of uh, antibacterial research, uh, perhaps in 2000s, uh, late uh, 1990s. Uh, and that gap, as you say, was taken up by academic academic organizations. But increasingly, uh, I guess we are finding uh, we are up against some uh, really resistant um, uh, organisms, right? And, and that's creating a lot of problems. Yeah. Yes. Uh, before COVID nineteen, it there were projection from WHO was that. Uh, uh, by 2050, the uh, infections from resistant pathogen would uh, overtake uh, cancer as a cause of uh, of uh, mortality. Mm. So, uh, and uh, no one really knows how it's the situation is going to be post the pandemic and uh, COVID-19 and uh, people in the ICUs intubated for a long period of time. So they're uh, uh, very resistant acinetobacters, they're very resistant Klebsiella's, of course, uh, ESBLs, and uh, even more resistant than that. And MRSA now, it's part of the hospital uh, uh, consult service. Uh, sometimes I have more patients on uh, with MRSA than uh, anything else on my list of patients to see. Well, yeah. So those are very severe infections, those are, are very aggressive pathogens, uh, and... Uh, 
we, for the longest time, we used to believe that those would be only associated with hospital uh, patients and that uh, they wouldn't never come from the community. And we, that was completely false. Uh, we have uh, people, young women, uh, who sometimes come from the community with uh, a UTI mm. that is uh, caused by an ESBL, uh, very, very resistant uh, gram negative. Yeah. And they had never been to the hostel before. And, uh, and uh, regarding your point about the pharma uh, abandoning uh, over the last, uh, uh, you know, one or two decades, right. abandoning this field, uh, even before that, there was a lot of me too kind of molecules. Yeah. So, the, so we, we, there are two, two uh, periods of uh, decreased uh, discovery. It was one period where everybody was trying to get a new cephalosporin, third generation cephalosporin, like a me too kind of approach. Mm -hmm. And then there was a second period where uh, uh, the whole project was abandoned. And we can go into why this happened. Again, I don't want this to, 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 to be like an academician <laughs> yeah. playing pharma. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. We, we, we will. Uh, we can go into the Mercer discussion. But uh, I want to also ask you: Is a surrogate uh, host approach work for viruses too? Hey, I'm not a virologist, so we do know that uh, there is a, a a lot of. There is some work on on using some hosts uh, and in virology. For me, uh, pathogens are two kinds of pathogens. Yeah. The pathogens that go from human to human, and viruses are, you know, usually the uh, most common uh, uh, pathogen that goes under this category. Yeah. And there are pathogens that go from uh, that they can live in the environment. Right. So those are the two categories, and I'm good at this second category. Mm. Uh, those are bacteria, fungi, whatever can live in the environment because that's where invertebrate models and the, those pathogens develop their virulence in order not to kill humans. Yeah, Humans became a significant part of the biomass just recently. <laughs> those, yeah. those pathogens develop their virulence in order to live in the environment, uh, avoid amoebae or survive amoebae, uh, invertebrate hosts, insects. That wh that's why they develop their virulence. And that virulence happens to translate, in some cases, in human disease. Mm -hmm. so, so if we go back and we take an invertebrate host, actually what we do is not we are discovering something new. We go back and we try to see the host pathogen interaction where it's supposed to happen. Yeah. In the in, in a more environmentally uh, relevant uh, uh, host. Uh, now, going back to your answer, the viruses and those that go from human to human, I'm not uh, I'm not very good at. So I will uh, I will let others uh, discover those. <laughs> Yeah, so there is a there is a diversity uh, of a diverse set of hosts there, right? So I, I know that you know amoeba, um, even zebrafish um, have been tried, right? So there, there there appears to be a lot of flexibility there in terms of attempting different things. Yes, yes. Yeah, so what what uh, we have a, a meeting. Uh, of model hosts every couple of years uh, happens, uh, takes place in, in Greece, yeah. in a Greek island every time, uh, usually Crete, but other islands as well. So we are very happy to to go to, to my motherland and, and discuss <laughs> about model hosts. Yeah. And every time that I, I, on my, when I take the plane to come back, I realize uh, that there is not one single perfect model host. Not even the humans mm. are, a good model host, quote unquote. I often say the example of uh, a, a fluoroquinolone that was developed by uh, by Pfizer, yeah, and went through all the phases and became widely available and FDA approved, and it would kill gram positives, gram negatives, and anaerobes. Mm -hmm. I, I remember a good friend of mine called me and and uh, asked why why infectious diseases physicians are needed anymore because he would give uh, 
uh, Trovan to everybody and <laughs> everybody would be fine. Yeah. And then it was discovered that it causes liver disease and liver toxicity right. and it was pulled from the market. Right. So even large clinical trials in humans have their uh, uh, shortcomings. So as a result of that, uh, you can imagine how hosts, uh, mice, uh, rats, worms, uh, insects, uh, zebrafish, amoebae, they can all add something useful. Yeah. They can all answer some question, but you have to put everything into a context. And the, what we're trying to, to teach the, the younger scientists in the field is try to understand what the host can help you discover and understand its limitations, no matter what the host might be. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, Troven, is, as you know, is a famous, um, very broad spectrum antibiotic that, that Pfizer tried, which was pretty successful, except um, it had so many scripts in very short period of time that, you know, the toxicity that typically um, typically shows itself over a longer period of time actually showed up in six months. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think that the drug is still there uh, as a hospital administered drug, I believe. I'm not sure. I haven't used it for 20 two years somewhere there okay. Years, okay. Yeah. so uh, it can be could be theoretically available but i don't think that you can really use it okay uh, uh, and uh, and that is an example of, of how you know as i said before not even uh, the human clinical trials can be 100 percent. right right yeah so i want to talk a little bit about it so one of the recent uh, papers uh, that you have uh, you say that there is a critical lack of therapeutic agents to treat infections caused by non-growing persister forms of methicillin-resistant uh, MRSA. And uh, you have some ideas there to, uh, to to go after this. Could you talk a little bit about that paper? Yeah, yeah. We uh, That was, again, uh, uh, serendipity took us that way. Uh, uh, and... Uh, uh, just followed some of the leads and tried to to understand what uh, we we were seeing. Yeah. It took us uh, through some interesting what we f think that is a very interesting uh, areas of discovery. So uh, Staphylococcus aureus has a very unique uh, feature that is uh, it can go into a dormant state. Mm -hmm. And, and stay there metabolically inactive for a long period of time. Mm. This, is, this is quite interesting because uh, it could explain why I need to treat people who have staphylococcal infections for a longer period of time and why the relapse rate is higher than in other pathogens. Right, Essentially, right. every single staphylococcal cell, uh, bacteria, can go into this dormant state mm. and makes it very difficult for the drugs to, uh, to kill it. Because most of the drugs, they need to get into the cell, uh, find something that has to do with something, that, uh, with some function that is important for the cell to, to uh, survive and, and, and uh, uh, really work through that route by disrupting that uh, that important function. Yeah. When when the, the the cell the bacteria is uh, the bacterium is metabolically inactive, then they cannot really penetrate. They can there is way less that they can do in order to kill the bacterium. Right. Right. Now the 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 only one of the few parts that uh, the bacteria cannot do much about is the bacterial membrane the outer layer yeah. of, of their existence. The, the part uh, that uh, makes the bacteria differentiate from the environment. Right. That, that, is, uh, that, that is difficult to hide, mm -hmm. even if you are a very smart bacteria like uh, staph, staphylococci. Yeah. So uh, the problem with the membrane is that uh, uh, 
the eukaryotic cells, the human cells, also have membranes. So for the longest time, uh, we have had difficulty uh, finding compounds that can disrupt and work there because, uh, again, the problem of toxicity yeah. would, uh, would, would make this kind of discovery both uh, difficult as well as high risk. Right. And uh, interestingly, uh, with, uh, 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 with a group of compounds that we found through the, our high th- throughput screens, we were able to believe in the lack of toxicity because of the C. elegans story that I told you before. Yeah. And we found groups of, of chemicals that really uh, affect parts of the cell membrane uh, of Staphylococcus. And now we are trying to discover what exactly they do in order to disrupt the membrane and find the exact targets of those compounds on the bacterial membrane. Mm. But this is quite exciting because those chemicals uh, alone or in combination with existing antibiotics, um, they can, uh, they can uh, disrupt the, the cells uh, and kill bacteria even when they get into that dormant state that I described before. Right, right. Will they be um, will they be slow acting lefteris if, if once it you know once it's in production will it will it be sort of a chronic administration? Hey, can you clarify uh, your uh, question? Will it be you know sort of, sort of you you have to treat for a longer period of time to make it effective? Yeah, for 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 the regular antibiotics, I have to I have to essentially outweigh the Staphylococcus. Yeah. In order right now, in order to get rid of a staphylococcal infection, I have to give my antibiotics for a long period of time that is too long for the bacteria to stay in that dormant state, and then I can kill them. the The hope is that with these uh, uh, more aggressive uh, uh, compounds uh, that uh, work against persist uh, against the metabolically inactive uh, 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 staphylococci. Yeah. I can just give them for a short period of time and can go and disrupt the membrane and I won't have to outweigh the staphylococcus to for it to get out of that dormant state in order to kill it. Okay, okay. It's sort of uh, cleaning the system, so to speak. Um, they, they're, they're not active. So these agents, um, they are not very toxic. Uh, but they can actually disrupt the membrane. They can selectively disrupt the membrane of the, the persister, uh, MRSA. Yes, so we, we feel that they have some, we, we don't feel, our data uh, indicate that they have some selectivity yeah. for one reason or another, and we're still trying to, at, at a molecular level, they have some selectivity towards the bacterial membranes uh, and not uh, towards the mammalian. Membranes, so yeah. that makes them a, a, a draggable, uh, i.e., not very toxic. Right, right. Yeah, I want to touch on another paper that you have um, entitled "A Study on the Cost Effectiveness of New Diagnostics and How They Can Be Implemented," um, where you show uh, statistically that combining molecular rapid diagnostic tests uh, with antimicrobial stewardship programs. Uh, seem to have reinforcing benefits. Could you talk a little bit, little bit about that? Yeah. Well, uh, the this is uh, I, I grew up in a in a in a modest household uh-huh. where we had to balance the books uh, on a monthly basis. <laughs> right. So, so there are two ways to balance the books: is uh, to get more money coming in, mm-hmm. and to decrease the amount of spending that you do. Yeah. So, so. Uh, Increase the money coming in. In the, our case, it's increase the the compounds that you have available, the antimicrobials that you have available to use. Uh, decrease the, the spending is is use your uh, existing antibiotics strategically, yeah. so you can maximize their use. So this is this goes to the other part of the equation, uh, how to be very uh, selective and appropriate in the use of antibiotics. Mm-hmm. And there are two areas where we use a lot of antibiotics. The first part is what we call empiric therapy. Yep. Empiric therapy means the patient is has an infection or 
looks like the patient has an infection mm -hmm. and I want to cover everything. I, I don't know what's going on. Right. Infection can be in the belly, can be in the lungs, can be in the blood. Uh, it can be a urinary tract infection, can be a gram positive, a gram negative, can be even uh, even some some fungal infections. Mm. Some fungal infection can be a virus. Throw everything that they have. Okay. Uh, use two, three, sometimes even four antimicrobials at the same time. Mm. Uh, and that can go for some time because our diagnostic ability is is completely archaic. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the antibiotics that uh, have uh, uh, have uh, uh, you know limited uh, options, and we have had a delay in significant discovery for a, for a few decades now. Yeah. Our most of our uh, diagnostics, especially for bacterial infections, depends still on the waiting for the bacteria or the fungus to grow. Yeah. We're waiting for it to grow. Like I and and this makes no sense right now because uh, we have we live in an area of of molecular science. Right. And but the clinical part because it is uh, uh, always a uh, discoveries uh, take a long period of time to go from research to to clinic. Uh, Still, it depends on blood culture and, uh, and uh, urine culture and <clears throat> sensitivity testing. Uh, and there is a, a growing interest in trying to use molecular diagnostics for rapid testing. Yeah. Uh, I remember vividly a, a few years ago uh, when I had a patient uh, who was septic, very ill mm -hmm. in the ICU. Uh, was on four different antimicrobials, and uh, I would go to the micro lab and ask if they had any any results, so I can optimize therapy, stop the antibiotics that don't work, give the best antibiotic that I have for the infection that they discovered. They would tell me, "Oh, uh, nothing grew." <laughs> At the same time, for my for my own research lab, I had a, a, a whole genome sequencing of different and the rococci, and I was able to get it back in five days. Right. Whole genome sequencing for a series of enterococci. Yeah. And I, it, it made no sense because the one in the one case, there was a human who was very ill uh, and uh, septic sepsis means uh, the chances for survival go down by the hour. Yeah. And on the other hand, I had a research project that can wait. <laughs> uh, so, so you understand that uh, uh, the, there is a real need for new molecular diagnostics. And, and the problem that we have there is how to convince the hospitals to invest. Healthcare, healthcare yeah. although, although we spent one out of five dollars in this country, even before the pandemic was, uh, uh, was spent in healthcare, still Still, the margin uh, that uh, most uh, hospitals and uh, healthcare networks work with is, is very thin. Yeah. So, in order to have a new, uh, a new approach, a new diagnostic uh, implemented, you need to make the argument that this will save money. Right. right. There is fragmentation of payers and other things that we can discuss. But at least, in order to get the 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 decision makers to listen to the need for for this new diagnostic and new approach, you need to make the argument that this will save money at least overall. Yeah, so the the score diagnostic tests are not sensitive, specific, and fast enough that we tend to use antibiotics, um, you know, sort of in a cocktail fashion. Um, so you, we are overusing antibiotics because we just don't know precisely what the infection, what the infection is and where the infection is, right? That's exactly right. And there is a lot of toxicity added yeah. there. And as a physician, this is what I am concerned the most. And also the problem doesn't stop there. If you have a patient, even 
usually you, you get the results in three, four days, a blood culture will turn positive or, or some other result will come back. And uh, by that time, the patient usually, uh, very frequently, uh, starts to improve with this cocktail of antibiotics. Yeah. Then clinicians are a little concerned. They say, why stop the antibiotic now? The patient was dying and now the patient is getting better. <laughs> why? Let's keep them going, all of them. So you, you, you hit the point, if you don't do it, if you don't change the uh, treatment really, and you don't impact the treatment really at the beginning, and you don't have good diagnostics, even if you get the information finally, sometimes that information does not translate into clinical action. Yeah. For a good reason, for a good reason. So what, what has happened? We have this, this tool that is called antimicrobial stewardship. This is a wonderful, wonderful uh, tool in the uh, reasonable use of antimicrobials in the hostel. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a, usually an infectious disease uh, with a, a pharmacist a collaboration uh, through the administration where they try to help. Essentially, what they do is try to educate uh, physicians yeah. to think about the overall picture. Yeah. If, uh, physicians, we, we always think about our particular patient that we have in front of us. We want, we feel the need to advocate for this patient, do the best that we can in order to help this particular patient. And sometimes that means that I have to give three or four antibiotics, give all the antibiotics, give broad spectrum antibiotics, and try to do my best to help this particular human being. Right. Now, the antimicrobial stewardship comes and tells me, wait a minute. Think about all the patients who come to the hostel. Mm. If you breed the resistance with the inappropriate use of an antimicrobial, yeah. then that will kill, maybe won't kill your patient right here, but it will, but might kill this particular resistant pathogen, a patient who is not even in the hostel right now. Mm. Mm. If you develop a resistant clone of, of a gram negative and that uh, lives in your ICU or lives in your uh, burn unit or, or surgical ICU or trauma ICU or transplant uh, a, a ward, uh, then that can kill somebody who is, who is not even in the hostel right now. So the antimicrobial stewardship tries to rationalize and help us, educate us to think about the big picture. And that tool, will, we feel, is the optimal tool in order to take that information from the new diagnostic tool and put it into clinical action. Yeah, yeah. Because it's there, it exists, it's, it is widely accepted. Now it's part of every hostile system, and we soon believe that it's going to be part of every long-term care facility and even the community, and can take the information from the micro department, from the new diagnostics, and implement it to make a difference. Yeah, but it's also a worldwide problem, right? So to, be, uh, to have a systemic effect, uh, it has to be implemented, I would imagine, across, across the world. Yeah, well, uh, that, is, that is ideal, but... Uh, uh, as we're learning now, in, yeah. even small wins count. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, sometimes trying to trying to get everything in place in an optimal way, it uh, uh, results in inaction. Yeah. We believe that get the antimicrobial stewardship as far as it can go, and then fight it to go even further. Yes, we need to have antimicrobial stewardship throughout healthcare throughout countries. For example, we found that uh, uh, athletes, in yeah. co collegial athletes have a high incidence of uh, uh, MRSA and other resistant bacteria. Right. Uh, we found that uh, travel uh, into to some countries is associated with uh, colonization with resistant bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yes, we need to have stewardship and infection prevention, as we understand it now with COVID-19, it has to permeate our society. We live, we are guests in yeah. an environment of microbes. Right. 
then we need to have those filters. However, we have to act as we work on getting this through uh, the whole system. And right now, Animal Stewardship acts very effectively in the hostels. Let's empower it. Let's strengthen it. Let's have it use all the tools and be our uh, advocate for the use, optimal use of new diagnostics that in result will decrease cost, improve outcomes, and uh, decrease resistance. Yeah, I find it, find it fascinating, uh, Lefre. So you say the prevalence of MRSA colonization among asymptomatic athletes is comparable to that among individuals with chronic illness and possibly higher uh, among them, uh, even you know, twice that for patients in intensive care units. So uh, I don't know if this, this translates into the COVID issue that we currently have. Uh, asymptomatic uh, patients may be carrying a higher level of or higher load um, I don't know if it translates. I'm, I'm just asking if that is that is possible. Uh, I think that I think that uh, there there are a couple of things here. Yeah, more than a couple. Let's take it uh, one layer at a time. First of all, you you said that indeed, uh, it's not my thinking. It's what the numbers say. Yeah, indeed, collegial athletes and other athletes have a. Uh, higher incidence of MRSA colonization than what we see in patients in our ICUs. Right. That is an unbelievable <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, thought process. There is uh, uh, an every, every so often you hear about uh, a, a football team or, or some other a team that has an MRSA colonization. Uh, there are a couple of extraordinary good professional basketball players who had their uh, career cut short because of MRSA infection. Mm. And we have uh, athletes, uh, we have young collegial athletes who come to the hostel and their first admission is with MRSA infection uh, that they didn't even know that they are colonized with. Yeah. So so th th this, is, this is something very very important to keep in mind because as, as humans, we tend to believe that uh, those things are somebody else's problems. No, <laughs> yeah. it's our problems. We all have bacteria. We are all vulnerable. And, and in that regard, this, is, this, this aspect can translate to COVID-19. Yeah. The, the aspect that we usually, our first reaction is to Oh, first or second reaction is, of course, as part of the denial mechanism to coping with a new reality, yeah. is to say this doesn't affect me. Right. And, and we need to realize that we are all together on this. Yeah. It can be COVID-19 today. It can be resistant bacteria tomorrow. It can be something else. What happens? It, it was Ebola a few years ago. Uh, and... HIV, even more a few decades ago, always we try to think that this is not a problem that could impact us and our family members. And we are always wrong because infectious diseases is usually, not usually, it's always a public health issue yeah. in its core. Right. And we are all public and we are all at risk. Right, right. Yeah, that's a that's an important point. Um, so, in conclusion, Lefter is you know, uh, looking at all your research uh, at Brown uh, and elsewhere. Um, if you look forward five years, you know where do you see the maximum potential? So, you know, research around the surrogate host, uh, high throughput screening that you are doing, um, the 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 diagnostics, fast diagnostics, uh, coupled with um, other type of programs. And uh, this colonization of um, uh, microbial agents, you know, in a in a core in a, in a group of people rather than a single individual. Where do you see the maximum potential in terms of uh, making an impact? Yeah, uh, the maximum potential, in my mind, is uh, is with uh, new diagnostics. Yeah, this is uh, uh, something that. Uh, 
It's a long time coming. And there are good discoveries. There is a excellent, exceptional, good techniques. And there is no question that those will, will change the way that we do, uh, we diagnose diseases. There is already a trend towards uh, new diagnostics. Uh, we have new diagnostics for uh, pulmonary infections uh, and uh, CSF processing. This is the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, I think that it's a, a matter of time that uh, those will change completely. Yeah. What I say to our students is uh, that, uh, uh, you know, 10 years from now, we are going to, to tell, the, they are going to tell their students about uh, uh, the need to wait for bacteria to grow. And they, they will think that that was crazy. Right. Uh, in the same way that when I start my presentation and my discussion is before the antiretroviral era of HIV, and, and the students think that I'm just... Uh, too old, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so so I, clearly that is the, the that is the one area. Then uh, an area that I I'm reasonably optimistic is animal clover use. I think that we are going to we have to uh, by necessity we are going to have to uh, optimize the use of existing antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, the area that I'm uh, less enthusiastic about and less optimistic about is the area of new antimicrobial drug discovery. Mm. Because there, you need to reframe the market. You need to uh, remake the whole field uh, without the existence of big pharma, uh, 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 at least for the part of the very early antimicrobial drug discovery. So in that regard, there, I'm less optimistic about. Yeah, uh, so the, you know, uh, it looks like diagnostics is foundational. So if you get fast, uh, specific, sensitive diagnostic techniques, that should, um, that should result in more optimum use of uh, antimicrobial agents and, uh, and generally perhaps slow down this path that we are on in terms of resistance, right? That is exactly right. I, I told you we discussed about the empiric therapy, which is therapy when I don't know what exactly is going on with my patient and I want to cover everything. The other part where, where you use antibiotics is we don't know how long to use them. And yeah. hopefully the new diagnostic will allow me to use it for, for a specific and personalize my use of antibiotics. Yes. Personalize means using the antibiotic for, uh, for enough time, but not for too long. Because right now, uh, for particular infections, they ask me how long to give. And I say, for example, two weeks, three weeks. Yeah. But, but this, is, this is an extreme. Some people might need a little longer than that. Some people might need just a week. Right. I don't know. I don't have a tool to help me personalize and tailor make the duration of antibiotics. If I have a very good diagnostic, then I can probably screen exactly for the existence of any dormant bacteria, any small amounts of bacteria, and if I get a negative signal, stop the antibiotic and follow. That will also decrease the overall use of antibiotics without putting the particular patient at risk. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these techniques being developed in artificial intelligence, for example, uh, could be useful too, um, you know, in terms of, as you say, personalized, personalized medicine. Um, really identify what is precisely needed for that individual rather than using uh, macro heuristics, right? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, we, we like uh, large data. We like uh, artificial intelligence. But when we go down to the particular human being, yeah. what I need to know is, is are there any more staphylococci in the bloodstream? Are there any more staphylococci in that uh, uh, joint yeah. that uh, will need me to extend the antibiotics? So, so that is that is the challenge that I have in order to stop the antibiotic and not get it go too long. Yeah, yeah. So that is that is more in the area of diagnostics. So diagnostics, it sounds to me, has to improve significantly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Yeah, this has been excellent, Lefteris. I really appreciate the time that you spend with me. And, uh, and, and good luck with uh, all the work that you're doing at Brown.
Thank you very much, Gil. It was uh, really stimulating talking to you, and thank you very much for giving the opportunity to reflect on those works. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.